No meaning, yeah. That's good for for your it's good. So animation, look at that. I want to use this uh, this one to actually show uh, what I'm gonna talk about. This seems, you know, bear with me, it seems very Microsoft specific, very Windows specific, but I really want to take the opportunity to talk about this to actually abstract the design uh, for the design challenges to actually go through that. So what I'm this part here basically is the Windows runtime, right? So if you think about basically is the surface of the API that you need to actually you are here, you are right, your new application for Windows 8. So by the way, if you haven't seen Windows 8 at work, I bought uh, an old, uh, this is not very fast and so on, but you know, it looks like that, some of the Windows 8 applications you can press. Some, something is going to work eventually. You can pass it around. Uh, this, is an old, uh, this is an old tablet, you know, that's what Windows 8 is right, the Windows 8 beta. It's not super fast and it's much better now. It's the same thing for Windows 8 phones, right? The same. Yeah, it's the same concept, right? It's it the just, same concept. It's the, 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 the it just ran here. Yeah. Like, this is the phone. You know, and the, that's called like Metro UI, the things you see, those square things and so on. Is the Intel phone? Eh? Is the Intel? Does it have Intel processors? No, these one, no. These are all ARM Qualcomm yeah. processors. That's actually an, in, that's an AMD 64 processor, but you know, Windows 8, uh, Windows 8 is going to run on ARM as well. So. Uh, to go back, you have to, yeah, you can show it. You have to slide that. So anyway, so here, here you're writing a new app for the little thing, and you're here. And what Windows did actually create a completely new surface for you, a new API for you to create, you know, to draw on the surface, to open the files, to you know, talk to the camera and uh, and do all those little things, choose a file and so on. So that's what we call the Windows Runtime, it's this new API surface. We described also the Windows Runtime surface in a general way through the metadata. And the metadata lets you basically, let's say you write your application here in C++ or maybe in JavaScript, you, I can see that you're a JavaScript user. You definitely see that. So in, ge in general, we want we want these languages to project in a natural way for C++, for JavaScript, for Python, for C Sharp, for whatever language you want to project naturally. This API surface needs to project naturally to these languages, right? So that's why we use the metadata for them. And if you go back, that's, that's actually what I want to talk about. I want to explain what the Windows runtime is, the design principle, and how we actually C++ binds to the Windows runtime. We have two types of bindings. A library-only binding, there is some helper classes that helps you, you know, talk to the Windows runtime and create objects there. Or we have, that is, you know, it's a library, it's, it's powerful, a lot of wiring is exposed. With C++ CX, we created a set of extensions to the C++ language to actually, you know, make this connection a little bit easier and a little bit more fast and fluid, basically. At the bottom, I really want to abstract the problem. Forget about Windows, forget about the Windows runtime and the bindings. When we write the new C++ libraries, what do we use? Do we use only H files? Do we use library? Do we use DLS or SO files and so on? So that's what I want to talk about in this. Uh, what more less would you guys? Is there my kit? I'm gonna help me do the presentation. I think this is Paul and Ms. Francesco. After two years, I cannot really tell them apart. Um, so, so what is the Windows runtime? First, kind of a definition is a, is kind of is a is the foundation to build a new application. It's only present present in Windows 8. So, to write that type of application, the one that you see, you know, in that Metro style UI. That's what we call that UI. The one, you know, the very touch of the address. So, the new API surface replaces Win32. The modern object oriented blah, blah blah. So, it's a bit of history. Think about yourself, you have $10 billion, you don't know what to do. And so, you are in early 2010 and you decide to revamp the, the developer experience for Windows Runtime. What do you do? First of all, I would throw away all the Win32 API, right? There's thousands of API. There's layers of layers of API. Maybe there are three or four APIs that do the same thing. You never know which one does the right thing. 
some words on XP, some words before, you should use the EX version, blah, 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 blah. If you write Windows code, it's, it's, you know, it depends on which level you write the Windows code, but it becomes pretty painful. So actually, that's actually what we have. We, did. we throw away all that. And then you also think very hard about how you make, you know, various developers, the developer experience more productive out of the box. Because what happened normally is that, if you think historically, let's say Windows 7 come up with a new set of Win32 addition, new Win32 API, new functionality in Windows 7. What we did in the C++ team, we were, okay, waiting for Windows 7 to come out, taking the Windows SDK, and then say, hmm, what do we add to MFC, for example? And so we go and manually wrap the, Winter, the flat C Win32 API or some COM APIs into, you know, a MFC, a C++ style, right? And the same C Sharp was, was doing, was waiting for the new versions to come out and then manually create C Sharp abstraction on top of that. Python did that and so on, right? Um, so that's kind of, you know, labor intensive and also, you know, it's not automatic. What we want to do with Windows, uh, with Windows 8, the, uh, with the Windows runtime, that actually the runtimes describe its own surface and the languages can automatically project this new surface. So the modern API surface is going to be object oriented. You want namespaces to actually find things pretty easily instead of you know having one, one million input files when you know it's one million. And we use async patterns anyway because you need to do that. You know, you don't have to block the UI and stuff like that. Uh, and like I said, you, you try to enable as many, you know, major programming style as you want, as you can. You go completely native with C++ or, you know, manage like C Sharp or Java. Or you can do dynamic languages like JavaScript that is very powerful and or Python or other, other languages like that. Um, so that's what happened actually. Windows called up a bunch of people from Visual Studio and uh, they put us in a room for a couple of months and we kind of thought very hard, oh, do we want to do it and so on. And more or less, you know, that's what we now see after, you know, a bunch of fights, oh, let's do it like that, let's do it like that. That's how it came out. Oh, we also invented a new string type, yeah. of course. <laughs> you can't. You can't. You must have a new string type all the time. So, I mean, seriously, the, there are few design principles in WinRT, right? First of all, like I said before, intelligence tuning automatic presentation of the, fi of the feature set of the API surface to the the various languages. First class citizen for the various languages. Uh, the platform can actually own the version. As the Windows runtime evolves, automatically everything gets you know, better. There's a lot, a, a, a small set of low level constructs, kind of a small set of uh, um, you know, API concept, for example, like uh, async or collections or delegates. We're going to go through that later. Um, so that's what the design thinks, but what's really the winner time? Um, how do you actually implement the wi Windows runtime? So basically there is a collection of objects, right? There's an object to open the files, an object to, you know, to, to get the camera and information to get where you touch on the screen and stuff like that. So basically each winner key object is very similar to a COM object in a certain sense. It's a kind of a... Um, in a, an evolution in a certain sense of the common object. It's based, uh, is, is, made, is built of one or more interfaces. So there is no data members, there is only interfaces, only big tables. You construct an object through a factory pattern. So basically, you know, the constructor is basically just underneath the cover, the constructor create the factory and then ask the factory, oh, give me this object based on these, uh, these, uh, these uh, arguments. And it is described by metadata precisely. So the layout of the object, all the functions, all the metric calls are described by metadata. So the, if you have each language projection, each language like C++, C Sharp, JavaScript, we read the metadata and figure out the binary contract and basically uh, create a projection of this linear field. Basic types are always the same. Okay. And uh, there are very small numbers of patterns that are used across the API. So there's a sync pattern is per everywhere. Collection, we have enumerators, ranges, 
and go through a collection. That's pretty much it. So this, this more or less how it works. Huh? The implementation is in a random DLL. And uh, let's say you have a file information class. This is the class you see. The class is bit is of, uh, you know, one or more interfaces, basically. You know, each interface has a bunch of method calls. Property set and get, do something, give me the file, delete the file, whatever you want. And the, inform the, the, the class itself doesn't have methods on it, but all the methods are inside <coughs> different interfaces. Uh, all of this uh, is described by the metadata that is a separate file on disk. Here there is only the implementation that has a very strict binary contract. So through the metadata we can figure out the <coughs> binary contract and we know which entry point to call in the DLL. I should construct this option and so on. Right? The activation store basically keeps kind of a catalog of all the objects based inside Windows. But this is, is kind of a, a detail of uh, of, of you know of the windows of the object in the windows in the windows runtime itself so this a little bit what how the metadata works so this is your application and this is a projection basically the helpers that actually bind your normal C++ code to these objects that are you know living in the OS please when you say projection, I keep thinking H file. Mm -hmm. You seem to be talking about something that happens at runtime. Uh, I don't. Again, think about H file. It's a much better way to think. It doesn't happen. So it can happen. Winner, Windows runtime doesn't specify. Oh, you have to be statically creating a projection or dynamically creating a runtime. Okay. What C++ does, it does it always statically. Okay. Always statically. Uh, C sharp and JavaScript that are more dynamic, they have an history of more, you know, picking up things on the fly if they want to find so on. They do it in a in a runtime way. So they basically load the metadata, look at the metadata, create the projection at runtime and then call it up. Okay. But what uh, so that's why this line is dotted, but that's a very good point. I probably actually added to the thing. Uh, this generated a compile time for C. Okay. So once you generate once you create your XC or your DLL, you can throw away this. You don't need it. Uh, it's interesting. Yeah, you basically don't need it anymore, and you just need these and these, and everything works fine. Will you be talking about how the metadata is generated yes. in source code? Okay. Yes, I, that's going to be actually probably the next slide. Okay. <laughs> there is a, and the, if you look, we have two projections. So the metadata is going to be generated in two ways because of the two projections, right? the library-based one and the language-based one. The language, the C++ CX extension to the C++ language, basically have an inner knowledge of how to read the metadata. And they do everything in your source file. While uh, when you do from a library thing, you know, we really want to do it in a normal C++ way. We don't want to change the C++ compiler. So we will have external tools that from the metadata generate something that the normal C++ compiler understands, that is a H file. So that's pretty much it. So, so yeah, that's actually we described the not not the way I want to describe, but we described what we are talking about. Really. And somehow, somehow the Windows metadata generate we generate a projection statically or runtime, and this is used actually to connect and create the object or to the object and so on. Um, these are kind of just a quick reference to the basic types. There are the usual things, you know, there's floats that I didn't put here, integers. Everything is very well defined in, you know, sizes and, you know, and so on. It's not int. There's always int between 64, unsigned in, a char. H string is the famous new string type I was talking about. It's a reference counted string. So it's easy to copy around because you just, you know, add a reference to the string. And they are, you know, is an immutable string, similar to the, you know, the .NET framework string or the Java string and so on or you know, a const w string for the man. Um, enumeration are the normal ones. The structures are, you know, are basically a, co a collection of types, right? You know, basically value types, a collection of, uh, is that just a struct with no, uh, no, uh, with no members, no, no function members and so on. And you can contact, con 
you can put basic types neat as trees. Um, arrays, we have a small support for arrays that should be used kind of, you know, just for very small arrays, kind of fixed size arrays. Uh, interfaces in general, like, you know, the iFile info, generic interfaces like iVector that are, you know, expect, I mean, that are used, you, that are used, uh, you know, you could, you can create, you know, generic interfaces and, uh, you know, use them. They're used mostly for collection types. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the class itself, the class is really a collection of interfaces. You know, the class doesn't contain anything really. You don't see any of the data member of the class. Of course, they are there somewhere. Yes. Um, looking at the simple arrays, I can't help thinking that with C11 arriving, now we have the standard array and mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, definitely. I'm hoping that this same <laughs> the API yeah. can deal with, that yeah. we can deprecate the classic C array. Oh, yeah, yeah. These, these are not mapped as C arrays in our projections. So, yeah. yeah. I, I guess I'm saying I'd like to see normal C arrays be Good. deprecated yeah. in favor of the right. new arrays. Yes. They, I, so, this is a little bit misleading because is written in a C++ um, syntax, but these are not really the C++ types mm -hmm. you see right? okay. in the projection. So, yeah, I think you're, you're, well, I, I completely agree with you. We should throw away C arrays as much as we can. Don't use them in the project. Even flag them if we can. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's where we are going. So also these array here are <coughs> actually even a little bit more complex than the normal standard arrays. Okay. Because they are reference counted, they are kept alive. They, they are a little bit safer in a certain sense because um, they are a little bit more complex, so a little bit heavier. But one important thing is to keep the lifetime of the array of, of these objects is all very important in these cases. Well, the key word you're saying that an array is an object. Yeah. And so it moves, it moves and around. copies it moves like an object. Yes. 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 Okay. Um, these are the patterns I was I was talking about. We have basically collection that maps, you know, very naturally, you know, to basically things like STL collection. In our projections, in the C++ projection, you can iterate through. You can just think about these guys like normal STL collection. So you just do begin, begin or end. You do normal for loops and so on, but like nothing different. Uh, that example begs the question, what do you mean by observable vector? Are you going to talk about that? I won't ask if you already are talking about I, I won't. I won't talk about that, but I can. I, it's not in my slide because I didn't want to go in all the details about we know time, we know run time. But we can talk about it if you want. No, let's keep yeah. going. But, I mean, very quickly, you know, this really, uh, this is a vector view. So basically it's just, you know, a read-only vector. This is a vector where you can, you know, change the content and so on, the map, you can figure it out. The observable vector has extra methods where you can, you know, there are events that you can sign up for oh. and they tell you, okay. oh, right. I've been so changed, right. the size has been changed and so on. Right. It's a concept that is more common in Java and in, in uh, C Sharp, for example, in the .NET framework. And uh, again, of all, all these are objects where the lifetime is very well structured. Mm -hmm. So they stay. Uh, I think I always think about these things from a C++ point of view. Think about the share pointer of a vector, the share pointer of a map. And then if you keep the, the vector around alive to a share pointer, it's easy actually to talk about you know observability and so on. Because it's somewhere, and then you can subscribe to say, oh, the, even the subscription is keeping the pointer alive, right? Mm -hmm. So all these normal things where when I think about observable something with a normal flat vector or something, I always get scared, say, okay, do I take a reference, do I take a pointer, do I, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. But if you think about all oh, this is reference counter, really. The model here is really that there is always an embedded share pointer, basically, in every object. Every winner key object is like having an embedded ref count. It's very comp. Okay. And you can take weak references out of them. So it's exactly very similar to share pointer model. Right? If you don't want to keep the things alive, you take a weak reference, then you can play the same model. And I'm not going to talk about those details, but you know, I can leave. Delegate is really a function pointer, you know, it's like standard function more or less. Um, events, 
the things we were saying, layout changed, or the collection has changed, or you know, very useful in UI when you want to subscribe to something that happens in the later time. Property sets are kind of a set of properties similar to collections. And the async operation is kind of almost everywhere. Everything in Windows runtime that takes more than 50 milliseconds has been changed to any sync operation. So basically there is, you just say, you say, I want to start this operation. I want to start reading a file. And uh, I'm going to give you a, basically a function pointer, a delegate that you can call, you Windows can call when you actually start reading the file for real. But I'm not going to block and wait for you to actually read the file, hit the buffer, and then give me back the buffer. I'm just going to start the operation and come back. So that's almost everywhere. This is changing. This is a big change. The last thing is a big change compared to the normal Win32 API we are used to. So when you said has been changed to, it almost sounds like you have uh, deprecated the blocking variant. Presumably you have blocking wrappers around them. Yeah, that, that's exactly what's happening. Okay. So create file, you cannot go and do that. That's interesting. Right? So when you want to open a file, you have to use a WinRT API to open a file, to read a file, to read the pictures from the disk. But if I simply want to block for it, you've provided a wrapper and a projection? Uh, the blocking wrapper, really, we don't have them. No? Uh, we, for files, it'd be tricky because C runtime surface is mostly unchanged. So file open, F open is still there. Mm -hmm. But uh, another thing I didn't think, talk about here is that the application, the Windows, so we are also talking about, when you have to think about Windows Runtime and Windows 8, you have to think about two, two models. Right? For example, you see here, I'm running Windows 8 on this machine, right? right? This is your normal, you know, desktop, with all the normal things you see. This is the desktop part, you know, the normal desktop and so on. All the application that works in here, you know, Office, you know, Word, Adobe Photoshop, everything, as the entire surface you have in Windows 7. You know, same API, create file, whatever you want. Nothing changes there, right? Uh -huh. You also have access to a small set of this WinRT API from desktop, small set. When you go to the macro style <coughs> mode that is here, is this one or the Windows, but when you go in this mode, these type of applications they only have access to WinRT. So for these applications, so basically when you're building an application in Visual Studio, you're, you will tell Visual Studio and the Windows SDK, look, I'm building a macro style application. So the pound defined is gonna basically shrink down the size of Win32 API you can call. If you go in the Win32 normal in Windows.h, you will see a lot of if devs mm -hmm. that we actually, you know, partition, they are actually called partition up, partition desktop and they partition the surface that you can see. Okay. So when I talk Win32, mostly we talk about this space, the macro style space. These are the keywords we use to define. When you talk WinRT. WinRT, sorry. So um, do fibers uh, get exposed in WinRT? Um, because I when you start talking about async operations, everything is async, yeah. I want a way to make it look as if I'm blocking yeah. in the code that I write. So for that one, um, I don't. Also because you are telling me this because you're not going to block in the UI file. The main worry of Windows, why Windows went to the Windows 2, this async model. The things they, went, they want to worry, they want to avoid is that, you know, you start opening Evernote and Evernote goes to the to the, to the cloud to get you know your you know your, your nodes and they do that on the on the main thread on the UI thread. Sure. Everything blocks. Right? Mm -hmm. So you are a good programmer, so you're gonna create a side thread and actually do the things there, you know, in a blocking way, but they are on a side thread anyway. So you're not blocking the UI. Sure. But if you if you're providing these operations as async, I don't even need a separate thread. All right. Um, exactly. But what I'd like to do is I'd like to use a fiber to organize my code so that the part that wants to read from the cloud uh -uh. can fire off the, the request, give control back to somebody else on the same thread. Mm -hmm. But when I get my result, then I wake up and resume yeah. processing the request. So we are doing with the, I mean, maybe we are using different terminology. For doing that, our, our you know, projections 
mm -hmm. they use task continuation. Okay. So that, that concept of task continuation. So basically, when you when you have, I can show you the code very quickly. So let me show you, for example, what this application does. This is an application that you know that we're going to use it a bit. And here I'm, you know, when I do this, when I press this button here, mm -hmm. I create the file open picker. Mm -hmm. This this screen here is basically a com is a, is a winner T object. Okay. That you know that open basically your picture folders and, and figure out all this functionality already there. You know, and this is basically a function that we are gonna call and say, oh, give me back a I vector view of uh, of all the files I selected, right? So you, you, I mean, this is more or less like you imagine, right? So what we are gonna do here, we basically get all the images here on my sheet, uh, and then you can. We, we hooked up a sim an algorithm that we found somewhere, an open source algorithm to actually detect faces mm -hmm. in the pictures, right? So as you see, you know, the faces comes in, you know, in a, a sync fashion, right? Mm -hmm. Nothing is blocking, they come in, they add and so on, right? So I'm gonna show you a little bit the code that we use to do this one, this. Okay. And the code is gonna be like a task continuation code. And this, what is it? Basically, so for example, this is the load button, right? Mm -hmm. When you load, this is kind of where we create the picker, right? Yeah. We tell the picker, oh, can you read, actually? Yeah. Yes. Is it too small? Should I, should yeah, I can put it bigger if you want. Mm -hmm. okay. So basically, you are telling the picker, go to the pictures library, not the document folders or so on, right? You know, show me the thumbnails and all the file names, blah, blah. And then what you do here, you actually, you know, you tell the picker, okay, now that you're all set up, actually pick the files, pick multiple files in a, in a sync way. Mm -hmm. So you don't even block, right? And what we do, this is an async operation, right? This is basically an interface that actually, um, maybe the, so this is the type return. It's actually a I async operation, mm -hmm. T of T, right? And that is the return type, basically. You're just going to return an I vector view of the files. Mm -hmm. So the async operation tells you which type it, it, it will eventually return when it's completed. So if you look inside the, these, uh, maybe we can do it. Uh, if you look inside, there is a couple of methods in this async operation, like uh, set the completed header, uncompleted. What, I, what am I going to call? I'm going to call this other function. So what we do here, we actually put this async operation, that is the raw async operation coming from Unity, inside the task. The task is actually, uh, that task class is one of the task, is one of the classes in the parallel pattern library, the library that looks like STL for, you know, parallel things. And basically this, ta this task is going to wrap this start this async operation and set up a continuation. The then part there is a continuation. And what you pass to a continuation, you pass a lambda, lambda. Yes. That, that you say, okay, when I'm gonna be done, when this task is gonna be done, when this async operation is done, I really want you to do this. And that and that async operation will return an I vector view. This is the argument of the lambda. Yes. And so basically, you you see, basically you're writing the code as is kind of synchronous. I mean, what do I do after? What do I do after? You don't have to write this continuation in another place or set up, you know, I start here, I complete it, and so on, what's happening, or, or state machines and so on, right? Yeah. Basically, the state machines is inside the continuation, right? Yes. So, so that's, that's, that's the model we want, we'd like you to use for or async operation in C++. I still believe that I could write better code if I could use something like a fiber to organize those mm -hmm. things. I would wrap that continuation so that it returned to my fiber. Mm -hmm. And then the code that I write, the logic that I use to process the result, mm -hmm. instead of being a chain of nested um, Continuation. continuations, yeah, because you I, could write, yeah. I could write code that looked as if it was blocking. 
Yeah. Except that it isn't blocked. So you're going to be fiber. I get this. I get the contact switch. But you will need that. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, that's inside here. They are, they are doing that. Even you know, continuation, they put them on different, you know, work steering you know, fibers. But but you can do it. You can do what you want. So in your fibers, you are going to have basically a small strip okay, so machine. So I do have a fiber available to me in the WinRT. Yeah. So you have standard threads. The standard threads are based on fibers. You. You know, standard threads, the standard Hong Kong thread that we create, not the standard threads, but what is it? I don't remember. But, uh, we basically, I, I'm not sure what you mean by fiber, but. Oh, okay. I'm talking about the Win32 API fiber concept, which is okay. within a thread, I just have a separate stack. And yeah. so yeah. I can trade off control between these different stacks inside of the same thread. It's, um, I, I'm not positive that that API is still available in. Okay. But there is, a, there is another now. thing that is called a thread pool that does exactly, it's like a fiber. So you can use the same concept. Okay. So I why you want the fiber versus the thread, for example, right? Okay. Because you want to be more lightweight. So you have lightweight threads in certain sense. So that concept that, is available. That's kind of where I'm going, but okay, yeah. let's keep going. <laughs> that's okay. Where is it? Come and jump down. Um, okay, that, I just want to do that demo that I just <laughs> did. Okay, Perfect. Okay. <laughs> Perfect timing. So, um, did I want to show you, uh, yeah, I want to show you maybe something that's a little bit in general, you know, a little bit about, you know, um, here I'm using, when you see these heads, I'm using C++ CX, I'm using the extensions that we wrote to C++ to actually talk to WinRT. Anyone familiar with C++ CLI? I am. So, so this, this is not... Yeah. Not that. It's the same not. syntax. But not C++ CLI. So uh -huh. Oh, I was looking at that thinking, okay, yes. it's just managed C++. No, it's That's not. the first thing people think. This is it's not. Native. It's all native. 100% right? native C++. Okay, this is just use, this head is used in, 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 as an abstraction to create the binding that I was talking before. So I'd like to hear more about that at this time. Yeah, we can go through it. So, Okay, this is basically an abstraction of the string, each string, new string, and so on. Um, these are the namespace inside the windows. Basically, here, yeah, what I'm doing, I'm reading the, the metadata. Yeah, I'm, on all these metro projects, there is one big metadata file. It's called windows.winmd. That is a, a, the description of all the Windows 32 uh, API, I think it's here. See, the format of the WinMD is, uh, is the same as the CLR metadata. I don't know if you're familiar with that, with the .NET framework metadata. So you can use tools that are already out there to actually explore what is used there. So that's, that's basically the entire surface of Windows right now. You know, of course, you can read down in all these extra you know, namespaces and so on. For example, we were using the file picker that is, you know, where is it is in storage and there's a bunch of stuff in storage. Mm -hmm. you know, there is I.O., blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Right, pickers, I don't know, whatever. Is there a file, storage file? Is that storage file? Mm -hmm. I'm not that familiar with the CLR um, API, but is this um, surface, does it closely resemble what you have now in CLR? No. Okay. I mean, just is. CLR is much larger, does many, many more things. This is really about the core parts of the OS. Okay. So, definitely knowing that part, uh, you, the naming is a bit similar, more or less. The organization is kind of, you know, uh, for that. But there are, you know, really basic things like cryptography and networking, file system, okay. some graphics thing. So it's a new API. It resembles yeah. the existing API, but it's not. It is not. Yes. All no. of this is, is native code. The metadata format is sim sim similar to the CLR metadata, but it's a totally different API surface. Okay. Yeah. And all of these actually is uh, So well, that's the metadata and, you know, we have this concept like, you know, we can create in the, I'm not going to go too much into that, but with C++ CX you can create your own winner T classes and actually expose them through modules. So this, this, this 
this demo that I have here, there are two projects. There is the client here, and there is the and, and, and DLL that actually wraps that open source library to do the fist detection. That's a normal, you know, open source library with its own DLLs and so on. It's a normal flat C API. And what I did, uh, I just, you know, wrapped that wrap that class, you know, that, you know, these, these APIs from that library with some, you know, C++ CX, basically, you know, I created a couple of methods, extract faces, or, or extract faces async, mm -hmm. that I'm going to call, that I, I'm calling from my, or from my, uh, from this project that is actually the exit, that has all the UI and a couple of buttons at the end. And I'm going to call into this module down here mm -hmm. and basically, you know, create uh, this one. I'm going to call into these guys here. Again, through Win32, through Win WinRT, sorry, through the mm -hmm. WinRT. And, uh, and so it's, it's a nice way, as I, as I was, as I want to talk towards the end of this talk, uh, we created basically a, an interface between this module, this DLL, this library, and the client of this library. So there's a metadata file being generated for yeah, the library. Good. So you see that this project, we generate its own metadata file that describes like the three APIs. It's okay. a single object created by this. So um, when I generate one of these, if I want that to be available as a library to you know clients, I would distribute the metadata file with my DLL. With the DLL. And for example, you just build these, you could write this in JavaScript and HTML files. Yeah. And they will naturally, because they have the metadata file and the DLL, they will naturally bind to whatever you write and you know use the same functionality as you see. Okay. So you can so that so client above could be some other language. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. So actually we see in the future of Windows 8 C we see C being used even more to write these type of libraries. With some other languages. With some I other languages that are maybe more accessible, yes. a bit less complicated. Then again, even here, I, I'm gonna again don't touch too much, but uh, what we did, we created a new UI stack for C++. Uh, it's uh, XML based, XAML based. It's called XAML. So basically, you know, all the is XML behind here is describing these things. No, it's going to be this part here, these text blocks here, for example, is here. And there are two areas here. Here are uh, the original pictures of the kids, and here I'm going to put the faces, right? Well, we started seeing XAML in 2007-ish, mm -hmm. um, and so <coughs> presumably this is just an evolution of it. It is an evolution, indeed. Yeah. So XAML started in 2007 as, you know, the WPF format, mm -hmm. the backing format for WPS. Then in the board, there's a subset for Silverlight. And they were, WPF was an entire managed stack. Okay. Silverlight was already, if you looked into the guts of Silverlight, the bottom part, you know, the core part was already native. The parser of the XAML, the, the DX stack, because all of this is accelerated and okay. also direct action. And the top part, all the controls, the buttons were managed. The third evolution is the called XAML UI, that is code named Jupyter for a while, so there are only a few, but the, the, co the common name XAML UI that is now part of Windows 8, you know, one of the values of uh, the what is it? This Windows, Windows UI, UI yes. this, is this one? No, I don't remember. Oh, yeah. UI.com. Oh, UI.com. Oh, I see oh, it. Yeah. Yeah. So all these XAML UI. And that's the third evolution. It's basically similar like completely native because all these classes are native, the buttons, pair, and stuff like that. And uh, all of these, uh, you know, are basically, so that's the new UI stack that you can use from both C Sharp and C++. Because C Sharp is just talking to the environment. Or like C++, we are just talking to these WinMD, WinMDs or WinRT bindings. Yeah. And nobody cares if they are, you know, native or not native. So, you know, like we were saying, you know, there is also this new UI stack that lets you write more modern application in an easier way. 
So you can use this designer that we have inside Visual Studio, or you can use more advanced designer, mm -hmm. like the blend designer that I suck at using, so I'm not gonna show you. But if you have a good friend that is a, is a good designer, they can do animations, they can describe a lot of things in the, in the, you know, in the markup, instead of writing a lot of code to actually, you know, align uh, or, you know, reformat strings and so on. Yeah, I wouldn't claim I know XAML well, but I've seen some of what it can do. Right, exactly. So it's pretty powerful. And, you know, the fact that it's all native now, this tech, it gives, you know, a better turf, better control. You can embed it. Another, another use here is to, for example, embed a DX surface. You could create, you know, the, what we call the chrome around, you know, with buttons, overlays, and so on. And then the, the big part of your application, think about, you know, um, like this one, like so this one, for example, you know, this surface is clearly a D, DX surface, right? Mm -hmm. But you can imagine that you can write these little things here in XAML, for example, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not so sure if actually Adobe did it this way, but, uh, but for example, the PDF reader did it this way, right? I don't know if I have a PDF here. The PDF reader is built in-house in Microsoft. And so basically, they have, a, they have a large canvas that is a D2D canvas where they use, you know, direct write to write, you know, the fonts and so on. Beautiful fonts, very, very fast because it goes directly to the GPU accelerator. And uh, these little things like, you know, the buttons and uh, all the various browse and so on, these are all XAML right? Yes. Yeah. So that's the model. Um, So that's you know that's pretty much a very very quick overview of what you can do for how you can write a Windows 8 application right? in C++. This is a completely native application mm -hmm. uh, that leverages all a lot of new WinRT things and uh, and also leverages with some of the that that is part of WinRT. Okay. Is manage C++ or C++ CLI still part of the language uh, family? It is still part of the language family. It's um, we didn't uh, we didn't uh, um, it is not supported in the metro style basically. Okay, I was looking at the syntax with the hats and thinking it's close enough to C plus plus CLI that I could imagine getting confused when I went back and forth. Yes, well, it's, it's actually the syntax is is uh, is basically exactly the same. Mm -hmm. So you can get confused because now you're thinking about. When you do a, in C++ CLI, you do a GC new, you basically new up an object in the garbage collected it. Mm -hmm. And actually, if you notice here, you do a ref new. Mm. Where is it? Right here. Uh, right there. Right. So this one is not garbage collector. <laughs> because there is no garbage collection in Winner. There's right. not a garbage collector in Winner. It's all reference counter. That's why it's ref new. That's why it's more in a certain sense. Basically, you create a new object, and the reference count goes to one. When this object, when this face back goes out of scope, let's say we didn't return it. Mm -hmm. When you copy it, of course, the ref count goes to plus one or right? yeah. So this is going to stay alive. When it goes out of scope, you know, the destructor of this mark pointer, technically, is a share pointer. I always think about this as a share pointer or a recon pointer. Depends which one you're familiar with more. Right? If I talk to a you know Win32 ATL crowd, I say Compointer. If I talk to a Boost crowd, I say Share Pointer. Yeah. But they're really the same thing more or less. So here the ref count will go to zero and we go down. If it's zero, it's gonna be <coughs> the destructor is gonna be called yeah. about. So same here. So so no garbage collection. So there's no garbage. That's the big difference between C plus plus CLR and so the runtime underneath is really different. So there are the same syntax, same language binding. Metro has no CLR. Well, no. Wait, sorry. You know, you could, you, if you use a C sharp application, there will be. CLR. No, in, in C plus plus. In C plus plus. Yeah. C plus plus okay. is not using any CLR. Right. So, and the, 
Also, to avoid confusion, you cannot mix and match these C++ CX and C++ CRI. But of course, you can, you know. Most of the code here is just normal code. It's a standard vector on standard strings. You know, that they can move back and forth very quickly between the platform string that in a standard W string. Mm -hmm. There are, you know, almost the same things underneath. And, you know, the standard vector is very easy to actually, you know, sort of you know, I, you can you can you know create a, a high vector view from a standard vector. I, they interoperate pretty well, right? So always always think about that these things are reference counted. So a standard vector is not reference counted itself. Sure. So we are basically creating something that stays alive a little bit better. The lifetime is more controlled. But anyway, it is a little bit heavier, right? Because the there is a little bit more reference counting and things stay around a little bit more. But the idea is that these are additional to the you know, extension to the C++ language. C++, all the power of C++ native C++ is there. This is all native. C++ CX is only addition to the C++ language. And this should be used at the boundary. When you talk to WinRT, use C++ CX. When you get data from WinRT, use C++ CX concept. When you, you want a surface for surface your library, okay. then you use the CX. Then you use naturally C++ CX. Some of the types you need maybe a little bit in your implementation. I'm seeing, as I see more code being written with C++ CX, I see, you know, standard, I mean, this platform string bleeding a little bit more sometimes in your structure. It's okay. You can have, it's like, you know, it's like having a struct or a class that keeps, you know, a share pointer of something. It's fine, you know, you can mix and match, you know. The data, your data can be a, you know, a pointer to a file, uh, for example, you know, a file, a high storage item, <coughs> and, or, you know, or it could be just a share pointer to a standard W string, whatever, right? So you can really twist. Uh, can you use standard share pointer instead of ref? Uh, yeah, but you can use it, but the problem is that you cannot use it to talk to um, to talk to WinRT. Oh, WinRT okay. doesn't understand share pointers mm -hmm. because the mechanics are a little bit different. Because you know, the left count is a bit trickier. Mm -hmm. It might have worked, but we didn't really put a lot of energy into it. I could imagine a wrapper. Yes, you can imagine a wrapper. Oh yeah, you can definitely. So you know, um, if you look, so we have, so to simplify you writing a high vector view, we wrote for you a platform vector, for example, a platform vector view. That is a class that inside has a standard vector, it actually share pointer of a standard vector, and it uh, does the, the basically the interop for you. Yes. So if you look at, at the header that Stefan wrote, the collection.h header that is up here, somewhere, probably inside the DCH because we use it all the time. So, anyway. Um, so, if you look inside that implementation, uh, you will see more or less you know, how to mix and match you know, this kind of concept. Right? Pretty straightforward. You, you have to get used to it. If this is the first time you see C++ CX, don't say, whoa. Plus, there is the confusion with C++ CLI. That's not really helping. But, uh, you know, but in a certain sense, we reused a, a grammar, you know, a syntax that was already there. Mm -hmm. In both in our compiler, in our intelligence, we also reuse something that was already standardized. There was a lot of mapping between the concepts like reference, the lifetime, reference counting, string classes, value semantics, and so on. So I think I think it was okay. Yeah. And uh, after a while, people you know see the power of. I'm going to also uh, my my next part of the talk. Uh, I don't know, am I going too long? Um, can I ask about ref? Uh, is that a keyword in the compiler now? Yeah, is a, is one of those uh, um, sp space keywords. So ref by itself. Let's say you have a, a variable called ref. It's gonna work perfectly fine. So ref new is a keyword. Ref space new contextual white space keyword. Okay. The reason I ask is because of course of boost ref and standard ref. Right, right, right. Yeah. You know, okay. 
Great. So only if you do that, space, 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 new, then it's a key. But okay. so that's, that's one nice way to actually expand, reuse some key keywords without stealing them from the basic name space. Okay. So for that one, is is pretty good, right? I think we invented those white space keywords for C++ CLI mm -hmm. because we don't we didn't want to stomp on like value class. We had a bunch of stuff or interface class, class interface. Mm -hmm. So it worked pretty well. Um, okay, so projections. Um, so we talked about projections, and the C++ is actually two, right? So the metadata we can generate. Uh, so we can use WRL that is like I said is a library based approach or C++ CX. You got a taste of C++ CX just browsing through the code with me, with the heads, the rest new and so on. Uh, we can look a little bit more in the, what WRL looks like. WRL is, if you know ATL, it's a, it's a modern version of ATL basically. It's very template based. There are, you know, in AT, if you know ATL, there is tons of macros. There's maps, there is, um, when, you know, I wrote the first prototype for this thing, and the goal, there was no WinRT at the time, so there was nothing. Right? We were just wanting to, I mean, my boss, boss, boss asked me, oh, you know, I really would like to use something like COM to talk between modules because I have this ADI problem. And, uh, and I need something modern. I don't want to use macros and so on. So we wrote this kind of, you know, template-based ATL-like library. Anyway, so basically you have, you know, these two are the WRL headers. You know, and this one is the, the Windows. So this H file is actually generated from metadata. So the metadata can generate to a set of tools that I show you a, an H file that describes the metadata. That this metadata here describe, for example, I five open picker. What's inside there? Um, and pretty much that's it. What is if you look inside the R, is a you know is a middle generated you know H, H file, so there is a lot of crap. But in the end, there's only a couple of uh, interfaces and some some of these things, for example, the enums and so on. So if you look at these, I mean, it's a lot of code, it's a lot of writing and code and so on. That what you do, you basically create a component, so it, you know a wrapper. You can write, you can basically wrap. This uh, bare pointer below other red release semantics. This is kind of another wrapper class <coughs> called an H string that is again reference counted. You can set the, the string to the name of the class. And you call this Windows function and tell Windows, okay, I really want this window, this class. This is the class ID. So it's the name in com, classic com is usually good, and now they want to make it. Mm -hmm. And say, okay, create one and put it inside uh, this empty pointer, this, uh, this initialized null pointer. Uh, if every, if anything fails, returns an H result. So that you see the, the com stuff coming up. So all of these functions return H results. They don't throw exception. WRL itself never throws exception. So WR, one of WRL characteristics is that is exception free. Mm -hmm. The exception safe in a certain sense, but it also because it never throws exception. Mm -hmm. So it's always thrown off. It's always you know no throw. Um, is it is it is it really C plus plus? Not really, but there's a lot of environments. A lot. There is some environments that really don't. They are not wired because the code is older, because whatever. They are not wired for for exceptions. Um, some of the Windows code is like that probably large part of the Windows code. Mm -hmm. WRL itself is used to actually implement most of the WinRT object you see. So <coughs> WRL it was be first and foremost to actually enable Windows to actually write these WinRT surfaces. One thing that concerns me a little bit, there's an external tool that takes a metadata file and generates a header file. Um, but I'm thinking the compiler generates the metadata file. Mm -hmm. Um, so, if I am building and maintaining a library of my own, mm -hmm. I have to make sure that my customers get both a metadata file and a header file. No, because the Windows SDK gives out the tools to read the metadata file and generate an H file. 
Oh, so my customer can take the metadata file and, and generate the H file. So they, the metadata file is the, the true. Everything is generated from the metadata file. And that's done by the client as well. Yeah. I was worried about the possibility of shipping an out-of-date H file. I think I would, I would refrain myself from shipping the, the H file. H file gets very quickly out of date. <laughs> they are very easy to check in into you know, your build tree. Even if you are good as a library provider, you are good at providing new H files. You are never really sure that this, this your customer really picked them up. Say, ah, it's almost the same, I just keep the old one. Right? Or maybe I checked in the H file in 25 places, I don't find it anymore. Right? Yeah. So the, win, the WinMD file, in a certain sense, is much more, you know, it's control. the source of truth. Yeah, it's the source of truth and it should be used. You can create a build step at the beginning of your build to generate the H file, or you know, you can generate them at the beginning. Yeah. So for example, <coughs> these files, if you go in the Windows SDK, they are already there. But they are really generated from the Windows.WinMD. So the Windows SDK process, you know, as the Windows WinMD, and you know, as, as we package the Windows win, the Windows SDK. We also generate these H files for you, so they are pre-generated. Mm -hmm. So we ship everything to the Windows and the end H files, but you know we keep them in sync, right? Because usually these things are never really moved around because they are Windows either files or so. So, so these, you know, here we are kind of you know put. These are kind of properties, so we are setting a property to a certain value, not in case, right? So very simple things, uh, you know, require a set, certain amount of code, but you know, it's not very hard. More complex things like doing some UI with the WRL is just a disaster, right? <laughs> it's, it's, it's not really possible. So, but for doing more simpler things, let's say, you know, your entire stack is, uh, is con based, right? Um, one of the advantages of WRL, you know, so this more or less, you know, what WRS stands for Windows Runtime Library, by the way. So it's part of the Windows SDK, like uh, I said, predates C++ CX and WinRT. And, uh, you know, <coughs> key characteristic are no exceptions, only its result. It's a low-level library, so you have full control, you can do things that are, you can't really do in C++ CX yet, like out of proc servers, a little bit more advanced scenarios, right? Um, it's a library solution, so you don't need any extension to the C++ language to work. It's just a flat, it's a normal, it's an include-only library. There is no, you know, DLS, no nothing. Just include like four include files, file with the file with the wrappers, and you're ready to go. You have all the abstraction to ready to talk to WinRT. And technically, you know, you could use like, even a different compiler because it's a very, very standard library. So it's very variadic templates, some parts of it, but you know, we don't have variadic templates yet. So we use the classic, you know, list of uh, types and blah, blah, all the usual tricks. So, you know, I didn't, I want to show a couple of tricks, but I didn't have so much time in the presentation. So I'm just gonna show one small trick that we use. Can we, I mean, one of the good things is that if you have a lot of com code, you can mix it. It's very, very natural to mix WRL and com. So if you're already writing the entire module, let's say you have a DLL that is a com DLL, and you are, it's, it's all no exceptions, right? Because it's all its result based. Maybe then, then is a good way to use, you can extend it and use WRL, maybe, you know, to talk to WinRT or to expose a WinRT layer and so on. So, it doesn't hide, it doesn't say, or it, it, it really shows the calm nature of winner team as well. So, so this is the tool chain I was talking about. So you will need to build this projection, the H file, you know. The compiler is just an almost C++ compiler, so it cannot read or interpret the WinMD files. So what you do, let's say you created your own, you know, Acme WinMD or Adobe WinMD or even start from the Windows WinMD. This is this tool we created. Also, by the way, it's very, very simple to read through these guys. You know, there is a very well-defined set of APIs, very simple common API. You could have wrote this tool yourself. Okay. It's, not, it's not very complicated, right? You, know, you can you know, go through the metadata and say, 
oh, give me all the inus, give me all the interfaces, give me all the, the, the properties, the, all the functions in the interface, give me all the parameters of the interface, give me all the classes, and so on. It's very, very, it's this almost like a database in a certain sense. And uh, you know, there is very good APIs to go through it very quickly. And, uh, so, so this tool basically generates IDL files that are interface definition, the com interface definition language. And uh, you know, with the, with the, let's say inside here you have like you know, 20 namespaces, you will generate 20, um, 20 or 21 you know, IDL files. So we generate one IDL file per namespace to keep it structured like this. And then you still, I mean, C++ still cannot read IDL files. But you know, these are kind of, you know, and you can use middle RT, that is middle for runtime for WinRT, to actually read these uh, augmented IDL files and generate finally H files that you can just import. I don't actually know what the use of IDL files is other than to feed this utility. Mm -hmm. um, why do I want an IDL file? Uh, you, you, don't, you don't want it, but that's what the easiest things to generate. Okay. So, uh, it's, it's a bit, the, the technical discussion is, uh, is a bit trickier why we need IDL intermediate files. Um, it, I was just thinking there was some other part of the tool chain that read IDL files and did something else with them. Uh, I think it's it part of the legacy. It came from the com history. Yeah. The com had the IDL yes. legacy. Yes. Okay. The only two really two that that consume IDL files is middle RT. These type of files. Yeah. So, so, so in other things that middle RT emits that I didn't show you yet, is uh, is the is more com specific things that are you know the um, the wrappers for you know the auto prop and so on. So you know the the marshal, the marshaling code, and so on. So it depends how comp savvy are you. This will make sense to you. If not, just forget it. Just use the HMI. So this duty will emit also a bunch of other crap that you don't need for this scenario. Okay. But you know, it's useful in other scenarios when you want to actually. So the auto proc scenario is basically your X is here, and the DLL is actually starts auto proc process. So you have two process. So you have a lot of memory for these auto process DLLs. So it could be used for, you know, it's the DLL that, that these WinRT components needs to process very large amount of, you know, very large images, and you want to control, you know, the, the memory and so on. Um, what, is, what is this one? Okay, so this was just an example, right? For example, let's say, you know, I generated this act made of H, mm -hmm. and then we just use it as you saw before, right? Mm -hmm. I, you know, I activate the instance, and then, you know, I just do something with it. So, just to show that it just basically works. Um, so, I want to show you a little bit, I kind of want to digress a little bit, I don't know how interesting it is at this point, maybe, about, you know, how that CompTR class, for example, is done. Um, so, one of the things we need for WRL is actually we want to write it. We want, because, you know, the classic compointers we are we have, they are older, they are 10, 15 years older, and, you know, we evolved in a way that we actually, you know, think about, you know, security in a certain sense of, you know, elegance of code or cleanliness of code. So we try to use that, we, have, we try to use less macros for other parts and so on. So one of the things that in COM point, in classic COM smart pointers like ATLC COM pointer, Operator, ampersand, the address of operator, is not is pretty dangerous sometimes, right? Because what happens is implemented like that. So this is the com pointer, it just throws a pointer to something basically to whatever interface is here. Yeah, there is all the constructor, the copy constructor does the direct, the destructor does the release, blah blah blah. Well, the operator ampersand really returns just the address of to this internal point. So it breaks the encapsulation. And if you really want to get the, the address of the real object, it's not so easy, right? Because you can't just do ampersand uh, SP. Mm -hmm. uh, because it's going to go through these and actually give you back a T star star instead of, you know, 
and then you know, if you just reset this T star star without calling release yourself, you know, you are, you are leaking the pointer at this point. That's why we put this assert here. And we assert that if you take an address of this, that will be null already, yeah. because you are not going to reset it very quickly. Right? So what we did with WRL, for example, instead of, so the first time we did it, the component in WRL, I didn't add operator on percent. Then I, we gave out this library to Windows, and you know the tons of developers in Windows say, oh, "How do I take the address of operator and so on?" Because in COM everybody does these things, right? We do, you know, we do things like that, you know, you like the factory things. Since you never have the return value available for you, you always have to pass the return things here. So you always say, "Okay, fill up this code pointer with something." Uh -huh. right? And these, uh, these things usually, these functions, these older functions, they only take T star star. They don't take com pointers, right? So that's why this pattern is very useful. So all these, comp these developers say, oh, we really need to operate for 1%, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you have to do it for us. And so, so we thought about a way to do it in a safer way, without, mm -hmm. without compromising too much the usability. So instead of returning immediately, you know, the naked, uh, you know, reference to this internal stuff, we return the router that, you know, kind of keeps the guts inside, mm -hmm. and then we'll enable both scenarios. We'll enable this uh, kind of older style scenario, so if you really want the T-star star, we'll release for you, actually, and, uh, you know, and give you back the T-star star, mm -hmm. and uh, so this code just works. This operator 1%, is basically going to return the, the real pointer, the, the pointer of the pointer. But if you have, you know, if you write more modern code that actually takes, you know, um, you know, that keeps the, the <coughs> com pointer as a unit, and you use this upper class, the com TRFT, then, I mean, then we actually, we keep everything encapsulated still in the com pointer and it's much better. And at this point, you're really getting basically the reference to this object instead of to the guts of the object. Yeah. So we'll just, you know, there's one of the trick. Another trick is that we we are using a, a bunch of, uh, you know, meta template programming to, I don't know if you're familiar with the query interface. Normally the query interface is built, uh, query interface, you the query interface, the query interface. The com query interface, there is a similar one here. Okay. The com query interface is built like, you know, I give you a GUID of the IID, and then you give me back the pointer, right? So as you implement it normally, there is a map, and you walk to the map. Say, are you the good ID? No. Next one, are you the good ID? No. Uh, usually it's not source law, but you know, there's 10 interfaces, you go to the for loop all the time. I'll, we did it here, you know, in a more, you know, meta template, and uh, the code is generated by the meta template for you. So there is a list of, uh, in, there is a list of interfaces, and those interfaces are used to generate the code. So it's pretty neat. The code is a mess as usual with meta template. But you know, with variable templates it's gonna look much better when we have it and we change it. I can show you a little bit the demo about you know how we not <coughs> so in my example here I had you know I had the part that I, I'm gonna use WRL instead of I'm gonna rebuild it. And basically, you know, I Go through here. So we'll get the part of the to the carrier maybe. Oh. So we can we can step through, for example. So basically instead of using C CX to use the op to create the open picker, I'm gonna use WRL and I'm gonna show you that that it just works the same way. Right? It's just a lot of more lot more code. So basically, we go here. Notice that this, I'm going to show you also the interop between WRL and C++ CX. This is a C++ CX hat, mm -hmm. but you know, we are going to go here and actually fill this up with this WRL code. So we go inside this WRL code. This is not so possible. It's a little bit more real estate. Um, basically, we have to, you know, we have to use this one where we define. So to enable 
so the, the namespaces are very similar, right? The problem is that, you know, in the Windows storage pickers, I have the C++, when you mix C++ CX and WRL, you have the same interface, that one is a classical star you know, row interface, and the other one is the C++ CX interface. One sort of makes a result, the other one throws exceptions. Mm -hmm. And you know, if this just returns nothing, this is gonna return its result, but this is gonna return void. So they are really different, even if they are really semantic. They are different projection of the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. So to differentiate, we actually put the raw interface the inside ABI Windows Storage Picker. Okay. So everything is prepared with API. So you can actually talk about the see this one without ABI is the C++ CX. CX one, and this one is the WRL one. And then, you know, you need the WRL uh, components and another curve. This one is inside Raptors, and this is in Confluence. So you use, uh, you have to, you know, you have to talk to Windows and tell them activate this class. Windows is going to go through its guts and figure out, oh, that's it. It's inside this factory, I'm gonna, it's going to call the factory, give you back the pointer, and put it back here, right? This one actually goes to the, the nice operator app, not the scary one. Then yeah, we put a couple of, you know, we set the, va the, the variables here, the, the properties. This actually, this interest, this is a vector of string. So the problem is that uh, uh, IDL and COM, they don't work very well with templates, right? So they basically, they, that women the IDL tool, so the tool chain, you generate, you know, static classes for all your graph, your, your, uh, your template instantiation. So, if you see the vector, one means there is one template argument, that, and that template argument is a string. So, this could, could improve a little bit, but for the moment, that's how it is. So, we show a lot of the wiring. It's not super pretty, right? So, yeah, you get the file type filter. It's going to put it here, and then you can append that is, this is a pushback, maybe, on the vector. So you append the string to the vector. That's pretty much it. And this is how you, this is actually how you do the, you know, so you have open picker, that is, you know, a com pointer to a file picker. Get will give you the raw pointer. You know, you see it here. You. Right. That seems to be confused. You can, so everything can be, so, so a raw pointer can be cast back to an object at this kind of the base that I am known of a object a platform object hat is the I am known okay. of a would that have worked as a static cast? Could you static cast that? I no. It will not work. Because there are really different types, so we really want you to be a little bit more you know. Does it work? I'm not sure. I don't think so. Well, the, the good thing about static cast is that if you're doing something completely crazy, yeah. the compiler can tell you. If you say reinterpret cast, the compiler says, okay, okay. your own problem. Want. I think we wanted to also add a, a kind of a network function just to get, you know, to enable these things in a little bit safer way. That would be so good. So we probably do that. I, I think we have it already, I'm not 100% sure. And you know, and this is just a dynamic cast. So let's say you once you get the object head, then dynamic cast basically means do a query interface in this world. Okay. So the compiler actually optimizes around the, if he knows that class already implement that type, he can jump around a few things. Depends how much information it has in the code graph. Okay. So we optimize a bunch of stuff. When we, once you are in C CX land, the compiler um, has a very good understanding semantically of it. He knows that it does not refer to these at scope guards. Mm -hmm. He knows that query interface means something very specific. So the compiler knows about COM, basically, and can optimize COM better than, you know, can optimize COM definitely better than you just passing around COM pointers. What you normally do as a COM, advanced COM programmer, you optimize the code by hand. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't pass com pointers around all the time. You pass just, you know, const refs to com pointers, for example. You just, just like you pass const refs to share pointers around mm -hmm. to avoid it. 
if you know that the scope is thing stays alive, there is no need to ref, add ref, interlock, add ref all the time. But you know the compiler can do this for you, so that's nice. Okay. We'll see those plus here. So that's pretty much it. And then you know, of course, it works the, the usual way. And, you know, it just works. So that's pretty much it. Uh, that was the demo for WRL, I guess. And uh, this this is the same code in C plus plus CX. I want to show you the difference. Right? So this is exactly the same code. Much com much more compact. There's no check HR, there's no macro to check the HR result and do something like throwing an exception if you need to. Um, this is ref new. Um, you know, I mean, it's not very different, but as code gets more complicated, it becomes more usable. Even. So this code could throw an exception? Yeah. Okay. For example, this one. You know, it could, right? So in other interest, this actually, this code, the first time you write it, we throw an exception. <laughs> you know, because one thing that Windows 8 does is that you have to, as you write an application, and let's say you want to use the, you want to open, uh, read the, for example, the, the pictures files. You know, have access to the picture files of the user. You have to state that in a manifest. So there is a way to actually state that and say it's a, I mean, every time I write this code, I always get that exception because I always forget. Is it this one? Yeah. Of course, in Visual Studio, we have a designer for everything. So it's actually an XML file, but you can. What we call the other capabilities, right? We didn't even have that. Should have had. Anyway. Okay. Strange. Um, so you should check the capabilities here, and you should tell Windows, oh, I want to have access to the picture folder. This is a beta version, probably there was some ones. But if you don't say this one, and you try to actually access the picture folder, Windows will say, ah, no. So there is this concept of you know sandbox. So your 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 program is running in the sandbox, and calls Winner T and Winner T check if you have the right capabilities, and then gives you access to the camera, or the webcam, to the videos library, to you know, the internet if you want. Well, it's a nice way to see it. So, yeah, for the, that's why Refnew could throw an exception. Yeah. <coughs> or maybe, you know, just when you start actually opening the files. Okay. <coughs> yeah, that's what C CX is, you know. It's part of the C compiler. We use the C CLI start syntax, C component extensions. That's Exception based, automatically reference counting, strongly typed, deep integration with STL, well defined binary con contracts across module bundles. So it can be reused also to create you know, these binary contracts in general. No need for external tools because the compiler understands the WinMD files, the metadata files. So you could do it from the command line, you know, that's what we do with these project files. But you can actually do pound using that is like a pound include to actually. So interestingly, this is a little better than just including. Think about the surface you saw Windows WinMD, all the H files generated from that. It's pretty large, right? When you have an H files, the compiler just go and read and read and parse and puts everything inside there is a uh, symbol table. And there is nobody that tells you, well, don't put it, don't read it. You're going to make it this big. If you include it, I'm going to use it. Right? The metadata, in, in the, instead, is important on demand. As the compiler sees that you're using the file picker, say, so, ah, OK, the file picker. Let me check in the metadata where the file picker is. You know, what the compiler does, actually, goes to Windows WinMD and uh, through the APIs I was talking about mm -hmm. to create a very, very quick catalog of all the namespaces. Just namespaces, and it, it keeps that in this single tip. Then I'm, it sees that someone is going inside Windows component storage component picker. So I'm, okay, let me open that namespace. So it says stop, go back to the metadata, and then give me all the classes inside the namespace and just keep those. And then I, it says that I need i file picker. Okay, I need the I need you know the the the, the function definition for i file picker, and that's also the closure or whatever else. 
So in a certain sense, if the model, I would say, is superior to processing the entire race funds. Yeah. And um, the like I said, the compiler knows about the semantics of F. So it can optimize other F releases and query interfaces. Um, we've, seen, we've seen a lot of query interfaces being optimized the way. We didn't see a major speed up. Because in a certain sense, since you're using these things at the boundary, the things you actually do in your program, you know, always take more time than the query interface. But then again, when you use a query interface inside the loop, I mean, it gets gets lift out. So if you do very very short operation and a lot of query interface, so the demo, I mean, I just show you the code a bunch of stuff. So it's basically the same. Like I said, we can mix it up, you know, like this thing. So I'm going to follow up about the interpreter cast. Um, and this could be useful, right? You know, could be useful to mix up WRL and plus plus CX in some scenario. When you say light com, I don't know that phrase. Yeah, light com is kind of a keyword we use more or less. So, um, direct text, I don't know if you're familiar with direct text, direct 2D, direct 3D. A little bit. Yeah, they are, they are not you know, full con, full fledged con components, right? They don't abide to the complete set of con rules. Okay. The light com is basically they're using the interface module, the interface definitions, basically to, to create this stable ABI, like an object oriented ABI. Okay. But technically they are not, you know, um, they really rely, so one of the things in common is that you can always exchange the, the implementation and you should never rely on a specific implementation implementing an interface. Mm -hmm. What DirectX does sometimes cheats, cheats about that and knows that since he controls the factory, he knows that this Direct2D, for example, is the only one that can create a, a render target. So the render tag will always be created by us. You know, even if we, if we just, the user outside see only I render target. So sometimes they do some checks, internal checks on some hidden private interface, and then they cast back to their, if they are in proc, they cast back to their object so they have access faster without going to the beautiful code to some properties of the class. Okay. So, some, some craziness. Never let them see minus two, by the way. So it's safer. Um, so why we have two, so if you look at the other friends, like C-sharp, G-script, and so on, they only have one model, you know, to access winner T. And we struggle with this a little bit, right? Why do we really need two, right? Do we want to confuse our user even more, right? Um, and so the, kind of the initial POR was the summer of 2011. We were saying, ah, WRL is nice, but it's only for internal Windows development and so on, right? And then, you know, we, we just before the big conference, when we actually went out public with all this set of winner T and super fast CX and blah, blah, we decided actually to, to decide to have both WRL and C++ CX. Because, you know, I was, uh, I was reading this book that I, I like. It's from Tim Brown, and it talks about, you know, talks about, you know, going to the, to the boundaries, right, sometimes, you know, Let's say this is your population, right? The people, your customers. Mm -hmm. Most of the customers are here. But it says when you are looking for something new, you have to look at the people that are pushing the boundary, that are, you know, that are trying to use super crazy meta templates on one side, or very, very, very simplified uh, C++ code. No, they are kind of both, you guys are more, you know, on the boundary sometimes, you know, when you use very, very complex you do very, very complex abstraction or very, very complex problems try to solve. Most of the user base we have is here. Right? So I would argue that C++ CX, even if it's not very, if you say the strange, it's easier to use, is, you know, uh, it, it goes, it falls more into this band here. But, uh, uh, so it's important for us to go and push the boundaries right? and give opportunity to people to push the boundary. One of the key things of WRL is not beautiful, but it lets you do, lets you understand every single part of Unity. It doesn't hide almost anything from you, right? 
The only real abstraction is comp pointer that is not such a big deal. It's very, very thin. All the wiring is exposed. Is it good? <coughs> not all the time, but sometimes it can be good. So I feel that WRL is here, and so that's why we decided, well, you know, maybe it's useful to have it out to the customers, right? And uh, it's maybe not going to be used. We definitely don't tell everybody, go use WRL all the time, right? No, don't, don't do that, right? It's, you know, these are kind of the, the distinctions, right, the differences. Exception-based is very, very good in C++ CX. These are mm -hmm. being in the S. You know, the, you don't have the return value, so writing code that kind of flows well, you know, you know, get the property and do something with the property and so on. You know, it's very, very natural when you have the return value that, you know, gives you the property and gives you something you can do with the property. While here, you have to write 24 statements as pin. But you know, it's a pure library solution, and the smart point is very well understood. You can have the slow level stuff, but it's verbose and complex, right? And you need the external tools, and the conviolet is exposed. If you don't want to see that, then there's nothing nice about it, right? So there is pro and con, and for different people, some things are pros. Mm -hmm. and it, so it's really about you know catering to different different customers. So I think it's important. Yeah, I guess. Um, I would ask that you stress the recommendations because yeah. I work for organizations with very, very conservative management, and they would say, "Oh, old style is better. Use WRL." You know, and so I think it is the the most we talked about WRL anywhere when we went outside. Okay. Yeah. So I did it for you guys because I thought you were in that. You were there. But we're kind of the opposite. We we prefer to come from the other side. Yeah. I know, but you know, I think it's good to know it's there. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit like Assembler, right? Do you read in other Assembler? Very, 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 But there are situations where, you know, this is important. I mean, you know, it's not that Windows also, Windows, the problem with Windows is also C++ CX was not ready for them to implement using C++ CX. As we move to Windows 9 and C++ CX is now mature, they will use C++ CX to implement more, you know, to augment the surface of Windows 10. Yes. That's why also they use, w they use WRL for two reasons. You know, they are very non-exception based in some old part of their code base. Mm -hmm. But, you know, they do use STL a lot and so on. So you can't use STL without exception, blah, 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 blah. So those parts that use STL, they're already exception based. They also have a lot of comp code, comp code lying around. So mixing comp code and WRL is very, is very natural, right? For yeah. them. They have a lot of ideas and so on. So there's, there's a bunch of reasons. But, mm -hmm. so, so I don't know. We'll see how it works. Right? We also received a bunch of feedback that C++ CX is yet another invention from Microsoft, yet another extension to the language, blah, blah, blah. And it's good feedback, right? You know. And it's understandable. They say, well, why do I have to lock myself into something that only compiles it on MFC well, right? And so WRL technically came to rescue that case because they say, well, we're, st we're still talking about the Microsoft specific concept, right? That is Winner T. But at least we are talking about it in a C standard way with the libraries that you know create the right abstraction on top of this platform speci specific. You could actually cross compile WRL on some other platform if you needed to do that for some exactly for reason. some yeah. Or, you know, if a model similar to WinRT picks up on other platforms. In a certain sense, you know, that's what I want to go with the you know, with the other part of my my presentation is really uh, you know, if you think about the libraries, how we give out libraries and so on. You know, if it's a small library, sometimes it's very, very simple to just to give out the include-only version, right? Like WRL. WRL is in include-only. I give you the include files, you are good to go, you just copy the include files wherever you want, you reference them, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Second step is that, you know, okay, doing everything in include becomes a bit tricky. There's some shared state, there's a lot of code, so every time, you know, I have 20 million include, I mean, I put hundred include files to include. It also slow down my compilation throughput. So I put a bunch of stuff in CPP files, but I still give you the source. So you recompile everything. You are in control of your compiling with the, you know, 
a, square, a, set, a certain packing or a certain debugger settings or so on. So you're, you're basically in control and we just say, we give you the, 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 the sources, then you, you package them and compile them as you want. You ship them as you want to your customer, you do whatever you want. And the other things that we do often, especially in Microsoft, I guess, more than you know, in, other, in other platforms, we separate the compile. We create DLS or static libraries. And uh, so here is also a code obfuscation, right? People can see all the code here, right? Mm -hmm. If you have some secrets to maintain, or combo, or something, uh, you don't want to do this, maybe. I don't know. We do this very, we give out a lot of sources anyway in our libraries anyway. But then again, you know, sometimes you don't want the user to change the code. Mm -hmm. You don't care about they see the code, but you don't want to change because then they say, oh, there's a bug. You say, well, but you changed that. Yeah, but it was a source file that changed that. Yeah, no. Now I cannot support you, but I'm telling you, you should support me, blah, blah, blah. Um, so the problem here is that, you know, this DLL thing, this layer here is uh, what you expose from the DLL. Mm -hmm. And you know, in my opinion here, you have the full C++ power. You can, ex you can pass across the standard WStream, you can pass across shared pointers here and so on. But here, uh, you don't want to expose on this layer standard W strings and so on. Because standard W string structure, you know, layout is blocked inside this separate compiled code. And these things need to match now. All your code needs to match whatever is here. So you are blocking your code to a certain version, for example, standard with a certain version of the serum type. We just went through this, I moved some code from a DLL that we had created yeah. back into our statically linked executable because it was forever breaking. Forever breaking, exactly. So you DLLs do not well with C++ functionality. Yeah. And also, you are, let's say you have a beautiful C++ abstraction, yeah. you are downgrading, because one way to solve this, the, the classical way to solve this is using thread C. Mm -hmm. We did that forever. Chandler did see, you know, for uh, for his, uh, you know, beautiful C++ abstraction on top of, you know, Clang refactoring. He did write a thread C API, right, to talk to Eclipse, to talk to Python, to talk to everybody, right? And yeah. so you're, you're, you're writing, you're thinking very hard to write like something STL-like, and bam, you have to use, uh, you know, a thread WHR start point with the site, you have to remember to put the site. You lose encapsulation, you, you lose a lot, right? And you, you might lose also some curve, right? Because you have to marshal back and forth things that are not there. Yes. Lifetime is a problem, blah, blah, blah. So that's why, you know, COM is a little better than flat C in a certain sense. It's more platform specific. But then again, you know, interface, if you abstract COM away, just interfaces and so on, at least they give you an object for the to wait. And metadata is a, is it to be better again because it's more structured, it's more it's safer than H files, right? And uh, you know it can be twiddle, twiddle less in a certain sense than H files. H files can have a lot of macro or modes inside. So, so these I, I don't have a good solution for this, right? You know, uh, I like the metadata thing, um, but I don't know. You know, I'm seeing a lot of flat C API and as we write more open source libraries also, you know, in my team and so on, we'll probably just do this. We want the libraries to be used very, I mean, by a lot of different platforms maybe. So I don't know how much we can leverage metadata. Maybe we can leverage some common-like abstraction, mm -hmm. but I don't even know if it's worth it. So, so this is kind of just, you know, writing the, the various pro cons. There's always all the violation problems, you know. And uh, at least you don't have so much of the art. So, I don't know, there was really kind of an open discussion here. Yeah, no more questions. And these are my contacts, this is my email. These are some things that you should, you should, you should try to stay on top a little bit of these guys. Because we push out a, a little bit. I mean, I know there's so many things to read out there. Yeah. Um, and we try to push it. Also, you should tell me what do you, where do you guys go to get your information? Do you go to Stack Overflow? Do you get, because we like to get plugged in more with the, you know, what for us, we said Sumit, me, Diego, it was great to come here and, and chat more with this community that 
we don't have so much integration. Stefan is, is very well plugged in, but uh, in a certain sense, you know, for us it's important you know, you know, to, to listen to your feedback, to the problems you have, uh, the things you like, you don't like. Um, Cross-platform is very, very important for us, right? So C++, one of the major reasons is used is because it's cross-platform. Second thing is because it's super performant. You know, um, so we really want to piggyback on this, right? You know, we are thinking about, we are working on a, for example, if you read these, you see that we are working on a, um, a, a I mean, libraries to do HTTP REST server and client, right? Mm -hmm. And we are writing that for Unix as well, right? So, um, so the cross-platform part is, is really important. It's becoming more and more important. It hasn't been super important until now. And you know, all the things I showed you, you know, they're very Windows specific. Right? Mm -hmm. But, so we, we also work inside Microsoft. Right? <laughs> so for us, it was very important to create a very good way to leverage the, fun, the, you know, the possibility that the new Windows 8 will give you, right? Mm -hmm. So, but now that we're done with that, we really want to, you know, kind of more look probably at the cross-platform specific problems or, you know, maybe we really want the next things we do. We we'll also focus more on the uh, application that are you know magic application I call them. That you know takes a lot of different type of inputs like you know sensors around us, um, the, web, the cloud of course, but you know things like the Kinect where you can wave or you can talk to things or they can listen to you or your fridge knows you know how much milk do you have left inside things embedded device. All this, when I talk cross-platform, I'm not only talking Unix versus Windows. If you look inside the Windows ecosystem, we have a lot of, we have Windows C, we have the embedded that is not C, XP, Windows 8 client, Windows 8 macro style, and Windows 8 desktop now. Mm -hmm. So these are all different platforms for us, and we want to create, you know, oh, the phone, for example, right? You know, stuff like that, right? The Xbox, you can write small apps for the Xbox, right? stuff like that. So there is a lot of things that we have also inside Maxa is very important for us. And going out, you know, on the cloud, we have Azure, and there's a lot of Unix servers on the Azure and so on, on the cloud. So all of that is very important. But the other part was actually this magic application, right? Very, very performant application, like, you know, um, graphics, you know, and, and so on. So those are the focus that we want to have going forward. So, so we are going to push out information there. You know, these are kind of other videos. If you want to know more about WinRT and so on, this is a great place. There's a lot of stuff. Could you send the slides to uh, I will, I will, Ray? I will, I will send them to Ray. Okay. And this is Ray Fix at okay. gmail.com. Yeah, yeah. And this is the, this, we are always open to do user research, right? The idea is that we ask you a question, how you use C++, Mm -hmm. What you like, what you don't like, you know, it's very, very good data for us. Okay. And George was here, he's in the other room now, George was here all week. So anytime you want to contact him, just send him mail or whatever. Right? You can always send me mail. Now, any problem you have with C++, with Windows and so on, we know a lot of people. Right? I've been there for a long time. <laughs> there are always the same people around. So we, we usually find the, the guys that, that are the culprit or that can help you and so on. So, Thank you. Oh, of course.